uh, kind of my basic approach, uh, you know, the, the list frame complex, once again, just like the ankle, I mean, this could be an all day kind of symposium, um, but you know, the quick and dirty, this is the high point of two arches, your longitudinal and your transverse arch in your foot. And, and because this is kind of the, the keystone of the whole foot, um, I think it requires absolute stability and, and reduction. And that these are joints that by design aren't meant to move. So I think that needs to be reflected in how we, how we repair them. Um, and then just one of the quick note, I know there's a lot of controversy that should these be fused or not, or maybe not a lot of controversy, but discussion points. Um, I, I think it takes what's a hard case and makes it a lot harder for me. So um, I typically don't, don't do any fusion. So I'm not really gonna touch on that too much. Um, the role of the gastrocnemius, the root of all evil, as Ted Hansen says in the foot and ankle world. So, um, so the idea is that there's a lar relatively large number of people with, with foot pathology of all kinds who have, uh, I'm one of them, uh, who have a, a tight uh, gastrocnemius and this leads to all kinds of chronic foot problems like plantar fasciitis, flat feet, cavus feet, multiple chronic ankle sprains, bunions, uh, even calf cramps. And so when you, when you meet patients who have Liz Frank injuries, I just wanna put in a plug that you need to examine the opposite foot as well. Um, some quick and easy things that everyone should be able to do. Uh, you know, you can see for first three hypermobility, does the patient have a bunion? Are they, do they have flat feet or cavus feet? Silver skill test. So uh, kind of back to your pediatric orthopedic days of uh, testing the um, um, flexibility of the ankle and dorsiflexion with the knee flexed and, uh, and extended. And that, and that this plays a role because uh, uh, the tightness of the gastroc can put a lot of more stress on your repair. So you can have uh, hardware failures if you don't um, address this. So you just wanna think about this as well um, and uh, 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 take, take appropriate steps as you can with your uh, techniques. Uh, so my case is a 65 year old female. Uh, I feel like Carla and I kind of uh, swim in the same pool of patients. So uh, this woman is, uh, uh, did not have a high energy injury. She was uh, at a doctor's office with her grandson when she felt a pop in her foot just walking um, and couldn't really bear weight. Uh, she does have a complex past medical history. She's, uh, I get to meet her in the hospital because she's having more complications from her GI tract. She has a chronic open uh, ostomy for previous bowel issues and, and is there. She's pending TPN. She might need surgery on, on that from the general surgery standpoint. She has COPD and the always fun fibromyalgia. Um, she says in the past, she has flat feet on, on exam. She has expected swelling with a fairly extensive plantar ecchymosis. Um, uh, and uh, as you would expect, uh, and, uh, and our contralateral foot, she does have first degree hypermobility and uh, an exam in my hands that's consistent with a, a gastro contracture. Initial images, um, uh, not, not super impressive, but um, you know, comminuted third, base of the third metatarsal. The second is not lined up at all with the, with the middle. Normally though, there, you're also gonna see some dorsal displacement. I think because this was such low energy, this wasn't the case. There was a CT obtained as well, but those cuts weren't really all that helpful. Um, my basic approach, um, you know, I think you should take, take some thought about, do you want to perform something like a gastroc recession or, or even a percutaneous Achilles lengthening? That's super easy to do. Um, and that helps take the pressure off of your repair for, for later. It can also make your reduction a little bit easier. I use a dual dorsal approach over the um, first and second and third and fourth metatarsals. Um, one other key step, you wanna always examine the intracuneiform joint. So oftentimes there is instability between the uh, middle and medial cuneiforms. And if that's unstable, uh, even if you repair the, the first and second TMTs, the base behind them is unstable and that's gonna lead to a bad outcome. So you always wanna um, reduce and stabilize those as well. Um, I reduced the second TMT joint first uh, since it sort of, uh, now that you've built the cuneiforms, um, you can have a place to put your second, address the third through reducing that, and then I address the first uh, TMT joint last. And I'm holding each of these reductions with, uh, with K wires. And then once I'm happy with the reduction, then I can replace each wire sequentially with screws or plates, depending upon how comminuted it is. So in this, in this case, here's some intraoperative uh, X-rays or flow shots rather. Um, the bigger wires you see are 2.0 wires. I use those because then you can replace those with 
screws. So it's super convenient. You can just directly measure. You don't need a depth gauge. You don't need any fancy equipment. It's uh, uh, straightforward um, and relatively simple. Um, on She did have intracuneum form uh, instability. Uh, and the third was more comminuted than the CT or and certainly the plain films showed. So uh, there is one wire there and that's because that's the only approach that's more that I could get any stability. So um, at that point I was deciding that we needed to probably bridge plate that, that side when they're that comminuted. So you can sequentially replace those. Um, I do use a uh, retrograde three, five screw with lag technique across the first TMT joint. And then there's a second screw um, from uh, proximal dorsal to plantar distal on the first TMT to help lock that up because the deforming force is, um, uh, this wants to oak gap uh, on the plantar side. So, you know, like a Charcot reconstruction, you would put plantar plates, um, not really amenable in most folks for trauma situations. Um, so uh, you wanna try to lock that in so that the, you resist those uh, translation forces as much as you can. Um, so follow up x-rays at six months. She came in at this point, she was walking, she'd had her ostomy reverse. She was, uh, happy as could be despite her fibromyalgia. She was very happy with her result. Um, and, uh, um, really denies much, much in the way of pain. Um, just some final thoughts. I think you need to look at the opposite foot. You need to think about the, the gastroc. I think that these injuries usually require more rather than less fixation on average. And that I, I don't, in my my opinion, I don't think fusions normally needed. These joints are fairly small. When you put two screws across them, uh, you're fusing half the joint surface anyway. So um, I don't think that that's always uh, necessary. So I can open up to questions or we can move to Emily's case. So Ryan, I had a question for you. I noticed that you didn't include the cuts of the CT and you mentioned that she did have a CT. Uh, are you ordering CTs on these patients and do you typically find it helpful? Uh, so I, I, I do normally get CTs in this particular case. Uh, they it didn't really add much to the discussion and with the time limitations of the case, I, I, I had to make a choice about including them. Um, I do normally do get CTs on, on most of these. Um, so so I, I do think they're a, a very helpful tool to sort of see um, uh, some of the, if there's any other pathology, um, particularly between the, uh, cuneiforms or further down into the metatarsal shaft sometimes if it's a super high energy complex pattern. Yeah, I agree. I, I sometimes am tempted not to get a CT because I feel like in general, I over CT things, but I do find that it helps, especially in, uh, picking up combination that you don't normally see on X-ray. Yeah. I think, I think particularly on the um, plantar surface of the cuneiforms, you can see a lot of comminution that you, because of overlap, you just can never see on a, on a plane film. So those CT with the, the um, sagittal reconstructions are um, super helpful kind of um, to pick up some of those details. The other thing I thought was interesting is the way that you do uh, the second ray first. You know, I've always been taught to start medial and then proceed lateral. Can you talk a little bit about how you made that jump to starting with the, uh, we're kind of going for the money right off the bat? Uh, tri trial and error. Uh, because I just, you know, if you try the first, the first ray first and you work your way medial to lateral, um, I think it's relatively easy to sort of malalign the, the first, the first TMT joint because it's relatively flat. And if you get that a little bit off, then it makes it harder to reduce um, uh, the second. And so, um, you know, I kind of stumbled into it on one day when the first TMT was just not, it just nothing was working. And I'm like, well, let me just try with the second and it worked really well. So I just kind of kept, kept doing it. So, um, and I think if you kind of think about it with the, the proximal instability that often happens with these, um, you know, you can't really move on until you address that first. Um, and then, uh, because the second kind of locks in with the medial cuneiform being slightly longer. If you can see that reduction, then typically um, the first will kind of follow it later. Ryan, um, questions usually come up on, on these are, you know, you see one is, you know, how long do you wait till you 
to you Wayfair? And number two is, do you take out hardware? Uh, so in these, I, I uh, similar to a calcaneus fracture or a Taylor neck fracture, I, I will, I think these take a long time to heal. Uh, these are lig injuries uh, as well as bony injuries. So uh, I have these folks non-weight bearing for, for three months, uh, but typically in a uh, um, removable brace so they can um, work on range of motion. Um, and I typically do not uh, remove hardware unless it's uh, symptomatic. Uh, 